Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Leveraging Technology You Already Have to Create True Digital Experiences, Digital Transformation. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are AIM's Chief Evangelist, John Mancini, and from EMC we have Jim Hayes. And EMC Captiva is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. And before we get started, just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. Uh, by joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience. So feel free to open or close or resize the different windows. And across the bottom of your screen is a list of all of the widgets available to you today. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list, and that's on the right side of the screen area. But you can also, um, there are a few other documents in there and links that to help you learn more about what we're talking about today. And feel free to ask questions throughout the hour using the Q&A feature that's on the left side of your screen. And we will hold these questions until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. And this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to AIM.org's resource webinars page in just a few days. And now to introduce our speakers today, uh, John Mancini is an author, speaker, and respected leader of the AIM Global Community of Information Professionals. He is a catalyst in social, mobile, cloud, and big data technology adoption, and an advocate for the new generation of experts who are driving the future of information management. John predicts that in the next three years we'll generate more change in the way that we deploy enterprise technologies and whom we trust with this task than in the previous two decades. And we also have with us Jim Hayes, who's the Product Marketing Manager at EMC Captiva. And with nearly 20 years at EMC, Jim has held various positions in Western and Eastern Europe. But uh, based once again now in the U.S., he is the, product, uh, the principal in product marketing in the Capture division. So now I'm going to turn things over to John Mancini to begin speaking today. John? Thank you, Teresa. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit today about digital transformation from a little bit different perspective maybe than uh, people are used to hearing. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, there's, God, you can, you can go like on Twitter, you can go on, um, on LinkedIn, you can go just about everywhere, conferences, you know, everybody's yakking about digital transformation, about digital disruption, about digital experiences, and all of that is very, very uh, true, and it's very, very valid, and it's um, something people have to pay attention to. But the challenge is, is that everybody starts when they think about digital transformation from a place. And so um, the, the origins of this webinar was I started to think about, okay, well, what, um, what do we know in the space that we all collectively occupy? And how can we take those experiences and use them as a foundation to start to think about the next generation of challenges that are out there? So I thought we'd structure our time in uh, kind of five little blocks, if you will. So the first one, I want to start with just a quick snapshot of some research that I've been doing about digital transformation, about digital disruption, and basically make the case about why should you even care about this. Um, then I want to kind of fairly deliberately walk through um, four things, four steps that I'd like you to consider as you think about the challenges that you have in your organization. And maybe think about a pathway that you could use to take what you know now, to leverage what you have now, take those experiences and use them as a foundation to start to address some of the very fundamental um, transformational challenges that are out there. So uh, I wanted to start with just this whole question of disruption and give you a couple of examples. And um, the reason I do this is that uh, when I talk to people often about this, they usually have one or two pet examples out there. And, you know, it's pretty easy to say, well, you know, we don't want to be um, the next blockbuster that gets Netflixed, you know, and um, we just didn't even see it coming. Uh, but that would never happen to us. And so I did a little research thinking about this. And when I started to look at this, you know, there are so many examples in which the pace of technology change has changed the whole nature of how companies and organizations go to market, how they build value, how they deliver value to their customers, how they connect with their customers. 
And I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of that because I think, you know, I know in my in my business, the association business, I'm constantly looking at the fact that um, this business has really changed. And there's not really any reason for an organization like AIM or ARMA or anybody else to exist forever and ever. And there's always a chance that somebody could come out of the blue and totally disrupt you. And so when you look around at what's out there, there are signs of disruption everywhere. So here's just a couple, just to think about, maybe wet our whistle a little bit for the conversation that follows. So this first one, this is a Google Trends report, you know, looks at uh, search results in Google. And um, all this is, pretty simple, is um, what happened to MySpace. And you can kind of see my, MySpace cresting right there on the left-hand side. And that decline from basically peak to plateau happened pretty quickly. And probably people were just not even quite aware that it was happening. You look at this one. You know, who would have thought that if you looked back into 2010, you looked at where Nokia was, you looked at the presence they had in the handset market worldwide, um, and who would have ever thought that basically that whole capability in the in the context of just four or five years would evaporate, would disappear, would leave nothing um, of value um, moving forward. Take another example. Um, this is the um, tidal wave of digital photography. And again, you know, you look at this in retrospect and you, you think to yourself, well, golly, when those curves crossed about in the middle of the chart there, um, something pretty fundamental was going on, and somebody should have woken up and figured out that um, they needed to make some changes and that there was something very disruptive going on. But my point here is that um, this disruption is all around, and even in the face of um, some pretty compelling data, often it's pretty difficult to react. And that's why I think it's important to realize that we all operate in organizations that exist right now, they have a legacy associated with them. They have legacy technologies associated with them. And so it's not just a matter of uh, turning on a dime, you know, flipping a switch, and all of a sudden you're transformed. You've got to recognize the signs of transformation, the signs of disruption, and build a very deliberate strategy for how you go about thinking it. A couple more examples. Um, BlackBerry, this is a great one. You kind of... Uh, Look at uh, where things were in uh, 2008, 2009. Oh, my goodness, 50% uh, U.S. market share in terms of operating systems in 2009, and basically in the course of um, three or four years totally disappeared. Think about this one. Um, this is in the print business, in the newspaper business. Red line is print advertising revenue. Blue line is online advertising revenue. You, see, you look at that and you draw two conclusions. One is how rapid that decline was in the red line. And then secondly, in this particular model of disruption, what's going on there is that this was not a model in which online revenues fully filled in the gap that was left by the departure of classified revenues to Craigslist. What happened in this case is that all those revenues that were basically used to subsidize an entire industry were essentially divided up and dispersed amongst millions and millions and millions of Craigslist users and the revenue just essentially was dispersed and disappeared. Another example of disruption. And just a couple more. Um, this one, um, this is a curve crossing right now in which um, for the first time ebook sales are eclipsing uh, print book sales, something very fundamental going on. And so the last one, as you start to think about this, this is a survey that um, was done by Russell Reynolds and Associates. And basically, they asked executives, do you anticipate um, massive dis digital disruption in the next 12 months? And you can kind of get a feel that, you know, yes, those signs are out there. So I thought at this point I'd take a little bit of a breather and, and ask Jim just a couple of questions about his experiences about this. And, you know, the first one is that, Jim, I'm just curious, as you talk to customers, you know, are are they aware of this? Um, are there particular segments that um, see this as more of a challenge than others? Are there other are there some segments that see this more clearly than others? What's your take on this? Yeah, thanks, John, for the overview and the slides. There, uh, I think, yeah, you really highlight the point that that all these market segments are dealing with some level of uh, disruption. 
And within the individual market segments, really if you look at the, uh, the external factors are really the pace of disruption. So what we see a lot in financial services specifically is that these organizations are really faced with a lot of competition from not only traditional uh, competitors, but also from online or internet type uh, applications. So they're really moving towards uh, adapting quickly and uh, creating these kind of real-time interaction user scenarios where they can engage immediately with their customers really at that first point of contact. Uh, an example kind of that jumps to mind is, is Rocket Mortgage, you know, taking a lot of the lessons learned from mailroom mortgage capture and really applying that to a different market segment and going after those that mobile uh, market segment of users that are really interested in, in uh, real-time interaction. Uh, so that's kind of the external driver. I think on the internal uh, side of an organization, you have, you know, what's the digital maturity level of the organization and their ability to adapt. So this isn't only about uh, the technology or the disruption alone, but, you know, how determined are they from, a, from the sea level down to adapt to these priorities? Uh, so these really, uh, these companies that can be, uh, that are effective in doing this, what you recognize is they're driving more profits, uh, really utilizing platform technology to extend that out to their customers more effectively, and uh, are really valued more, uh, more heavily. So those, I think, you know, if, if you had to narrow it down, I'd say banking, insurance, and high tech are probably the, the, the leading uh, industries in that area. One last quick question before we move on to the meat of this is that um, um, why do you think most um, initiatives fail? What, what goes wrong with people? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, again, that digital maturity factor. We, we recently uh, uh, published a white paper around a digital maturity mod, uh, model and really talking about how innovative organizations can introduce and reinforce change management. Uh, a lot of the customers that we talk to are also using proven methodologies, uh, such as Lean, to really implement and achieve these goals. Uh, I think those are a couple of the uh, uh, the, the reasons that, that companies are really being effective. Another factor is, uh, and one of our uh, managers around digital transformation here, Patrick McGrath, talked about in his discussions with customers are the ability to fail fast. So you can't have these digital transformation initiatives that take up to two years to figure out if they're going to be successful or not. So what you're really talking about is the ability to get up, get it up and running. And again, success in a lot of times based on applying these uh, technologies to an existing platform to really monitor the success and see how successful that's going to be in, in the rollout itself. Yeah, I think that point about failing fast is really critically important. I, uh, golly, I think about how this space has changed in the last 10 years, uh, particularly the last 10 years, and uh, that uh, that two-year implementation cycle was not something that was unusual for a long time in this space, but it um, it just doesn't hang it anymore. Let me hop ahead, and um, what I'd like to do here is to, um, like I say, divide this into um, into four steps to think about. And um, and what I'm trying to do is lay a case that, you know, what, what people do with regards to digital dis, uh, transformation and dealing with digital disruption um, is not, it can't be totally divorced from what you already know, because if you, if you try to do it that way, it's kind of a recipe for disrupting your own organization. And you've got to think about ways of evolving the knowledge set within your organization to deal with the new challenges out there. So as you think about this, you know, um, capture is a good place to, to start when you think about this because really, you know, even though it's been with us a long time, um, it's all about digitizing information, for one. And then secondly, um, people recognize the business value that capture represents in an organization. And you can see that from some of these data points here. So it's a good, strong place to start the whole question of how do you think about um, digitizing your business, how do you shift from a past business model to a future business model? Um, I would argue that it's kind of a necessary but not a sufficient condition for moving forward, um, but it does give you a base and a platform to move forward. So as you think about this, I think there's, there's a couple concepts here that are important. Um, and one is, you know, part of the, the, um, 
the tale, I guess, that having a technology that's proven, that's been in existence, that's been utilized, that's been valued by people for a long time, is it tends to be categorized in one way rather than in an expansive way. So for many people, capture is just about paper. And um, I think probably all of us bear some culpability in, in how we've wound up at that place. You know, but the reality is that you know, capture isn't just about paper capture. Um, it's not just about document capture. It's, it's really about um, information capture and how do you capture all the information associated with customer interactions in an intelligent way, in a coherent way, and how do you apply the lessons that you learned along the way in order to make that journey a little bit um, easier? So I think you really have to move toward a concept of capture um, in which digital intelligence of information is built in rather than bolted on. And that's a real different way of looking at capture. But it also has lessons back in some of the things that we've all been doing collectively for the last five or ten years in terms of the disciplines associated with that, the techniques, the approaches. And, and I think there's some lessons learned along the way that can be applicable there. So I think my first question that I'd like to um, ping to you, Jim, is that, um, you know, if I'm right that there's, uh, that there's benefit in leveraging your existing capture um, environments. Um, how do you do that? Um, how do organizations approach that? How are organ how are, what's your experience in organizations actually doing that? Yeah, thanks, John. So, you know, traditionally, you know, over the, over the last 20 years, we've really been effective from the mail room or the shared services as a starting point in uh, eliminating paper as it enters the organization, getting it into digital format, uh, automating manual processes and feeding those key systems or funneling the information to the key system. So those have been the real goals. Now, as, as the market evolves kind of in this Capture 2.0 world, uh, what you see is the ability now to get those user interfaces and uh, capture services out to not only remote locations, so that's been going on the last few years, but really extending a lot of that functionality out to the end users themselves so they can interact directly with with the core systems, whether that be a bank, insurance company, or a government institution, the ability to really interact directly with with those uh, you know core ECM, BPM, archive, ERP type systems. Uh, one example, real quick, John, and I just kind of thought about this one as a is a top ten insurance company that we're working with. They have a, a really successful existing mailroom environment, and what they've done is what they actually kind of is coined a creative disrupt, disruption, is really going out and looking at existing processes and really taking a new look at it. So what they did is they went out, uh, the tradi traditional mailroom folks took a real innovative approach to eliminating all fax applications within the organization. So they did this looking forward in favor of enabling a mobile app to do the same thing. So some of the benefits, just, you know, high level, you get rid of all these fax devices. Everyone has a mobile phone. Now they can take a picture of the information. So much more accessible uh, ability to take images of the, um, the documents themselves. Also, the image quality is better than from the fax, you know, so now you have the ability to run it through advanced recognition, OCR, really extract a lot more metadata than you could with the fax. And lastly, and this is kind of where it was going, is uh, – it's a benefit to the organization itself. They're saving money, not having these um, hardware dependencies out in the field, but now they also have a direct interface to communicate with their end users and customers. So now when the customer takes a picture of the claim or a supporting document, they have the ability to interact, validate, send back any information, ask for supporting documents or attachments. They can take, the customer can then take pictures of that. So it's a much more interactive approach, and, and, and I think one of the, the key points there is it's a real incremental improvement in going out and finding these legacy apps, eliminating those in favor of mobile apps or, or customer-facing apps that really engage with their, uh, with their users. Yeah, I like that example a lot because it, it points to the fact that um, the process that exists is, you know, one that continues. It needs to be adapted to the changes in technology, but that 
but that process of having to interact with a customer, it doesn't go away. And so um, you got to figure out a strategy. I like that term, creative disruption. That's a pretty good description, I think, of what goes on. Um, second question, I'm, I'm just curious about this, is, um, okay, paper's declining. Everybody says that. Um, and yet I keep hearing conversations that the um, capture market is growing. Um, just what's what's your take on that? How, it seems like those those statements are in conflict with each other. Yeah, great point. Talking to a lot of the top analysts, you know, we go through this quite often. Is is really paper and, and the estimates are somewhere between five and seven percent a year decline in paper, and at the same time you have mobile that's growing at about twenty percent year over year. What we see as well uh, in our business strong growth in email import and PDF conversion. So. A lot of different electronic formats coming in, and this is driving growth that we, you know, could easily estimate at double-digit growth in 2016. Uh, one point, John, you know, keep in mind is that you really have to qualify that as well is, uh, you know, what is electronic capture? You know, it's one thing to get a PDF, uh, you know, in a, in a raw format and not have any intelligence around it. You might be able to recognize it's an invoice. It's another thing, you know, to really – do a deeper dive and an OCR and, and recognize the line items. What did this customer actually order? You know, not only the total and the invoice number and the customer ID, but really what are their buying patterns? So that's that's really kind of the next step in in capturing that information immediately uh, from these electronic formatted documents and funneling those out to the to the systems of record. Well, that's a good jumping off point because I think that um, there's a concept that I want to introduce here, which is that, you know, when I think about this, okay, you've got a lot of organizations with existing implementations. They've got existing competencies and experiences with regards to those implementations. Um, and and there's, a, there's a framework I like to talk about, and I, I call it uh, did, <laughs> it's, I, I shouldn't call it this because I always have a hard time saying it, um, digitization versus digitalization. And so... Let me talk a little bit about what I mean by that, and maybe you can um, then react a little bit to whether you think this concept makes sense or not. So I like to think that there's a distinction that, that we haven't all really collectively made, which is that digitization, we've, that's been with us for a while, and that's like this whole concept of getting stuff digital. That's a very technical description, I know. Um, but digitalization kind of touches on what you were just talking about a second ago, which is this idea of um, how do you change the way the business executes, um, how do you adapt the way it executes, you know, tapping into the information that you have now in digital form, you know, how do you use this as an engine for customer experiences, and, and I guess my contention is that those two things are not the same. And so I see this all the time when we do survey work um, with folks. And so, um, you know, a couple of examples here is this, and, and lots of times, you know, when I look at some of our industry watch surveys, they, they really touch on the fact that many, many people um, are doing digitization, and um, they're either not doing what I would call digitalization, or they're just kind of starting it. And so it's reflected in a couple of these data points here. So we ask people that, you know, what, that do do capture, um, what are you doing? with it. And so 34% um, say they're only uh, scanning flat images, 16% um, for workflow and 18% for archive. And so when I think about that, you know, that's really a like replace the file cabinets, you know, kind of an argument for this, which is um, which is not bad. I'm not saying that that's, that's bad because it's uh, many, for many organizations, it's a huge step forward. But when you start thinking about some of the parameters and characteristics that I would they are characteristic of, of digitalization. You know, are you using OCR? Um, are you capturing process data? Um, are you using all this stuff for adaptive workflows um, or using it within case management systems? Uh, most of the times when we ask questions about that, um, the rate of adoption really drops away. And so I think there's an opportunity there for organizations to take what you know in the digitization arena, move into the digitalization arena, and then use that as a platform really to start embracing transformation initiatives. And so one of the more stunning things, and, the, and why I think this is a good place to start, is that, is that you know, when, I, when we ask people about the ROI of their capture um, initiatives, 
uh, you get really compelling ROI numbers. And that's even with the fact that most folks are still just doing digitization. And so I think about that and I think, okay, you know, how do you make arguments for expenditures? How do you, you know, rationalize spending more money on some of these things, expanding your capabilities, moving into digitalization? Um, I think this is a good place to start, and it's, you know, tactically within organizations and politically within organizations, it's a good place to start. And so as you think about this, as I start to think about this, you know, the real key, you know, even though people have had very good ROI with this stuff, pursuing digitization initiatives, when people, when I talk to folks and we ask questions about advanced recognition, about taking capture and moving it out of the mail room, um, doing what I would call real-time capture, um, their, their ROI, even though the implementations get more complicated, the ROI goes up significantly. And so, so for me what that says is that, okay, you start with digitization, you push into digitalization, you take the lessons that you've learned on the first part, apply it to the second part, and use that as the basis to really get more engaged in process transformation. And so there's, a, there's just a couple things that I wanted to ask you about that. Um, and, you know, first one is just, you know, given that capture is, um, seems in all my data, drives the strongest ROI in the ECM segment, um, how are organizations pushing that stuff even forward? How are they pushing towards digitalization moving forward? Yeah, thanks, John. As, as you mentioned, a lot of a lot of organizations are scanning just to archive, you know, just to to remove file folders. What we're starting to see, even in those cases, are, are organizations really trying to extract, classify, and extract a lot more information from those documents. Uh, what we've found in our customer base, when we go out and do a lot of our, our discussions and kind of understand how they're using the software to automate processes, is that they're achieving very strong ROIs, a lot of times, you know, 80, 90% return on investment uh, with advanced recognition, you know, 50, 60% with just simple scanning and, and retrieval, and in the 90s with uh, advanced recognition, and that's because they're, they're capturing so much more information up front with no incremental costs for people actually keying or classifying the information. So what we've also found, and this is from the AIM uh, research and, and validated by a lot of the analysts, is that over 50% of the customers out there who are using advanced recognition are planning to implement more auto classification and text-based OCR uh, extraction. And I think the, the reasons for those are pretty, you know, pretty fundamental in that the more information you know, you're going to extract at a lower cost with the OCR engines and the technology improving constantly, you know, the downstream benefits are clear. You're going to be able to have more accurate data. You're going to be able to feed these customer-facing applications more effectively and in, in, in with better performance. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits as well as in terms of analytics. So what we're starting to see a lot more discussions around analytics and the ability then, if you know what the document is, you have all the information classified, or for instance, you've, you've generated a text searchable PDF on it, now you can apply a lot of uh, deeper analytics to, to, uh, to processing those downstream. So a lot of benefits with really extending that vision of advanced recognition. Can you give me a couple of examples? Before you do that, folks that might be new to this, just a very quick definition of advanced recognition. Just um, sometimes I know that we uh, we talk in code in our industry. And then secondly, any other examples that you might have of customers um, applying these technologies to do more with them? Yeah, and I think that, that's a great question, John. I, I really think it's across the board, you know, organizations are applying these out uh, to multiple applications and, and, and going after different lines of business. I mean, you can mortgage is a great example of, uh, you know, existing large mailroom uh, customers of ours that are extending uh, capture technology and a lot of the text-based analytics, which kind of falls under that advanced recognition category, looking for, for just different text strings and then being able to classify and extract data from mortgage applications. Another great one uh, are uh, insurance companies that are extending their reach out to line of business applications uh, that were in the past kind of secondary to their to their core business. So uh, we have now uh, customers that we're working with that are acquiring complementary insurance companies 
and uh, and extending this technology out to life insurance or uh, medical claims processing, such as vision and dental. Uh, so a lot of a lot of real use cases where they're extending the uh, the capture uh, functionality of advanced recognition out and uh, and really reaching out to those remote agents in the field as well. Cool, very interesting. I, it really ties into the to the third thing that I want to talk about, which is that um, you know when you when you think about digitalization and when you and 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 when you think about automating. Uh, processes. I think um, one of the things sometimes we make a mistake is that we we think that everybody's been there, done that. And the reality of a lot of our surveys, when we look at this, is that um, most folks have not even gotten down this pathway in terms of a lot of their own internal processes. And so, one of my contentions, as I think about transformation, is that this is a good place to start. Um, you know, given that you're not going to boil the ocean all at once. Um, you want to build credibility, you want to build allies, you want to build support, you want to build revenues for what you do forward. And so um, that ties back to um, getting your own internal processes under control. So this is some data we haven't published, but I just thought folks might find it interesting. We did a survey of 290 finance executives, and we asked them what was paper usage in, the in, in, in a whole series of processes. And so, and so what you find here is that um, there are lots and lots of paper out there in financial processes. So um, when we ask people to answer the question, a lot of documents are processed as paper documents. Um, you see, you know, in AR, in the financial close process, in accounts payable processes, you kind of go through all of these things. There is a ton of paper still out there. So, um, and in many organizations, even if they've digitized this, they haven't digitalized this process. So they might have uh, scanned some of the stuff in, they might have scanned an invoice in, but then they printed in to be part of the process. And so that's a good place to start, I think, in terms of thinking about transformation. Um, HR is another one. You kind of look at this. This was, again, stuff we haven't released yet, but 173 HR executives. And you see the same thing. You know, uh, recruiting and selection, 35% say lots of documents are processed as paper employee onboarding, um, file management, procedures and policies administration, employee separation, all of which says to me that there is, an, there is a, a real um, need for digitalization in organizations that we can tap into. Organizations can use it as a basis to start to improve their organizations in some very fundamental ways because you're going to have to do this stuff anyway. Um, if you have crappy back-end processes, no matter how elegant your customer-facing transformation initiative is, eventually your customers are going to come upon these back-office processes. And so getting these under control, there's a lot of really good experience out in the market can, that allows people to do this pretty quickly um, with really, really dramatic ROI that you can build on. And so I think the reason for this is that you know one of the enabling technologies that allows these processes to change so dramatically is is what what I call real time capture and you know and so what I mean by that is that everybody again going back to those old definitions everybody thinks about capture as being this thing that occurs in the mailroom with a couple people hunched over a great big gigantic scanner um, and and it really is an entirely different concept right now and and what it allows you to do is inject intelligence into your systems, into your processes, and intelligence that's critical to automating and transforming those experiences. And so as you think about that, just one set of data points to think about is that all of this is still in the very early stages in organizations. This is some data from one of our surveys, you know, that really highlights the fact that um, that you know, this is pretty early stage stuff. You know, we 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 like to think that we've kind of been there, done that when it comes to our core back end business processes. You think about contracts administration and HR administration and finance and um, sales and marketing. Lots and lots of opportunity there for benefits that then can be extended, not only from a financial perspective, but from an organizational learning perspective that can be applied to other use cases. Um, that deal more directly with external customers as well as internal customers. So, so maybe maybe I'll uh, just stop there for a second and ask you, Jim, just to, you know, 
how does that resonate with you? Does that um, how do you think that optimizing capture in the back office will lead to better customer facing apps? Yeah, thank you, John. So, and I think this goes to one of the reasons our customers continue to invest in these in these back office mailroom automation type environments so heavily, is really ensuring that the the, the data. Uh, is not only identified what type of document, but as many fields as possible can be uh, automatically extracted. In the, fa- in the past, you might only be extracting from zones, so like a customer ID number or an address field, and now they're really looking to capture as much data as possible to try to feed that out to these uh, mobile uh, environments. So as you mentioned, real-time is a great uh, example And this could be either like embedded within a customer's application, like in the case of mobile. It could also be a standalone application just running doing PDF conversion or some type of capture service. But the idea is that you're going to have in the back office the ability to capture the information in great detail to feed these more uh, thin client customer-facing type applications. Tell me, talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, I was kind of uh, listening, trying to digest it. And I think the, the the part that I like about that is, um, tell me a little bit of how you think the process, um, building a process on a capture platform, um, so making incremental improvements, supports that journey to digital transformation. Tell me, tell me, tell me about that. Yeah, I think it's fundamental, and and not just uh, coming from us here at. at ECD or, or Captiva, but really if you talk, talk to the analysts, you know, Gardner describes this as building a digital platform. And a lot of it's really uh, foundational in terms of, you know, uh, establishing your processes based on proven technology. For example, you know, some of our largest customers, uh, you know, take a, uh, an example, uh, one of the largest 401k providers, uh, financial services, you know, they started off with uh, scanning about 100 million images uh, a year uh, through the mailroom. They then extended that out in vision to over 200 remote locations with similar, you know, they can, they can extend out those business, uh, business rules to apply to those remote locations to really help their field workers process the information at the same speed that a mailroom would. So much more interactive in the field. And now what they've done is they've taken kind of, to go back to your real-time example, uh, and what Forrester describes as as CAS or Capture as a Service, and they've implemented our mobile technology directly within their portal. So now customers have the ability to scan, uh, fax, or take a mobile image of the document, which is preferred by by most, obviously, and then get that pristine mobile image back to the system for immediate validation. So really, they've, they've gone the whole spectrum, and they've ended up embedding a lot of that uh, mobile technology directly within their portal for that real-time interaction. So uh, the nice thing is you can validate against the information from the mailroom, but you don't have to run it back through a mailroom script or a mailroom process. So that really enhances the customer experience and the um, the performance in terms of interacting in real time. Cool, and good, good jumping off point to my uh, my last point here, which is this is I think really the the end exper- the end result that everybody wants to get to. So, my point here in the uh, context of this webinar is that you know often people I think um, try to um, immediately hop here. And, and that all these steps are connected together, and, and so are, and organizations are collections of technologies, they're collections of competencies, they're collection of knowledge that you have to apply to changes as uh, as those challenges change in the marketplace. And so um, this, I think, is you know really where you, everybody wants to wind up is you know what you want to do is transform the customer experiences. And so I'd like to just talk a little bit about that. And as I do so. Um, this is the fourth thing we'll talk about. Um, we'll break for some questions in a little bit after that. So we've already got a few teed up here from folks. So if you'd like to post a question, there is a question tab there. Um, just chime in uh, any question you like, and we'd be happy to answer. So let's talk a little bit about customer experiences. So um, this is a case where, you know, when I look at our survey data, there is um, – there's a, a real question of intentions in organizations versus reality. 
So um, this is a data point, and we see this all the time with the more edgier aspects of technology. Is that you know, on the one hand, you know, 57% of folks that we surveyed said that um, they are committed to digital transformation and that going paper-free and mobile capture and real-time capture are an essential part of that journey. Uh, but on the flip side, 24% come back and say that they're not looking at any mobile projects at the moment and 39% are still in the planning stage. So I think one of the issues there, as you think about that, is that you know, there's a gap between the intentions of organization and their ability to summon the resources um, in order to address the problems that they know they need to address. So I thought in just the last two slides that I had here, I'd, I'd spend a little bit of time thinking about the benefits of all of this, thinking about the benefits of revolutionizing customer experience, both from the perspective of the company, because after all, you have to justify all this stuff, but then also just think about what this means for the customer in terms of revolutionizing um, this experience. So from a company perspective, you know, when you start thinking about ways of getting closer to the customer, more flexible, more nimble, more agile, you know, what basically you're talking about are ways to expand the geographic and customer segment reach of a company, um, ways to increase business agility. Um, when you think about a efficient and effective back office processes, what you're talking about ultimately is that last bullet of cost reduction. Um, I think this question of business model flexibility, I start thinking about revolutionizing customer experiences, whether they're on the internal side, in terms of internal customers, or on the external side, um, you start going down a path that generates more opportunities for flexibility in the organization. And then the last piece I think that you wind up getting, the one that uh, Jim was talking about just a second ago, which is the, the tie of all this ultimately to insight and analytics, is that as you move down the digitalization path, as opposed to just the digitization path, you know, what you start to do is acquire information that provides insights into the nature of processes, the nature of customer requirements, and allows you to operate more effectively as a company. And so if you flip this over to the customer side, you know, this is the um, person on the outside. You know, what are their benefits? Which ultimately is the reason you want to do it, but you've got to do that stuff on the previous side uh, in order to sell this stuff internally, is that, you know, what you want, you know, customers have infinite choices now. Um, even internal customers, when you think about it, you know, in a SaaS-based enterprise application environment, they, you know, if they don't have solutions that basically speak to their desire to revolutionize their own experience with internal processes. They've got a lot of options they can deal with in terms of looking for options that their IT people don't even have to be um, involved in. And so from a customer perspective, obviously personalization, convenience, simplicity, you know, everybody wants an Amazon-like experience in terms of no matter what the process is that they interact with. Um, ultimately, if you revolutionize that customer experience, you put it closer to the customer, you put the information aspect of it closer and in the hands of the customer, um, ultimately you're getting the customer to do more of the work themselves, which it has the double benefit of satisfying their needs, but also drives down cost at the same time. And then ultimately, you know, the more external processes you can put in the hands of customers, you know, it allows you to extend those processes into social networks, into relationship networks that, you know, are really the source of um, how many people look at how they make buying decisions moving forward. So with that as a jumping off point, Jim, you know, maybe you could talk specifically about that jump to insight and analytics and how does what you do on the capture knowledge side and the capture experience side tie to that question of insight and analytics. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, and I think it's really all about, you know, understanding that incoming information. And, and then also, as you broke it up, you know, understanding the benefits to the, to the organization itself. And these, you know, we're, we're hearing much more in terms of capture and process analytics, understanding business intelligence, uh, a lot about the usage, how individual customers are using these, uh, the information. Uh, and then also the content analytics is, is a good one as well. So really that's about understanding the nature 
of the information, and having that, uh, those, those data points really can help the users as well downstream. So helps the organization, but also helps the users. Uh, an example, you know, transactional capture processing is really immediate where you could pr process an invoice or receive a payment back or, or a check cashing application. That would be an example of a real transactional process. And a less um, interactive one would be, you know, capturing a contract. But downstream, that would be great. You know, if, if you're a customer, you go into Verizon or, or a, a mobile phone provider, you immediately have access to that contract information. So, again, uh, both are critical, the transactional piece as well as um, kind of more fixed con content capture and the ability to uh, extract more data up front for the analytics. And, and as you think about some of these projects um, that are focused on customer experience, um, and, and when people approach projects from that perspective, um, what's different about those projects? How are they different from sort of the, uh, the traditional projects that we've all undertaken in this space? Yeah, good point. I think it really, and again, it reaches out closer to the customer in terms of the, uh, the interaction uh, and the user interface that's really tailored for that type of uh, use case. So uh, one example, you know, I'm trying to think of, a, of banking as a good one, but, you know, mobile check processing, as I just mentioned, you know, it's been around for a few years. At first when it came out, you know, it was just a real exciting technology. You didn't have to go to the bank anymore. You could do a lot, you know, directly with your mobile phone. Now it's really become expected, right? So uh, financial organizations are looking for ways to extend that out and create more, uh, you know, kind of awesome customer experiences as well. Uh, one good one, we work with a financial institution that's, that's uh, processing claims as well as checks. So they're really tying these two processes together to really gain uh, synergy and kind of um, scale. So in this case, and I just presented with them at, at a user event, and it was really interesting to hear about their application, not only in how it benefited their organization and cutting down the claims processing and payment uh, time. They were, they were spending between five and ten days per claim before they could actually pay their, their clients. And uh, so the money was kind of sitting there in limbo. They'd have to process the, the full claim. They basically went to a lean methodology using some of the mobile technology, and now they're down to 150 minutes on average from five to 10 days. So, you know, from the customer, from, from our customer standpoint, you know, major benefits. They're also saving a million, over a million a year just in interest alone and having that money freed up. But long-term, really the customer uh, experience is enhanced because now they, the customer can take pictures of the of the uh, information, supporting documents, interact directly with the system, and have a much greater uh, confidence in being able to get that check in a hundred, you know, in two hours as opposed to five to ten days. So, you know, that's a good example of, of again leveraging mailroom technology out to an established check processing environment, and then extending that to claims to enhance user experience. Does that does that make sense, John? Yeah, I, and, I, and I think that's really that's really a good example because it almost follows that whole pathway that we've been talking about from kind of beginning to end, and um, and that's really I think an important an important factor in all this because it it leverages the learning of an organization but applies it to new challenges that are out there. So absolutely, um, I wanted to give you a chance to just talk a tiny bit about. Um, EMC Captiva, um, before kind of going there and also going to questions, got a whole set of questions teed up here. Um, I did put together um, uh, a little while ago a tip sheet on customer experiences. And so um, that's at, uh, we'll send this link around with the follow-up email for this, um, for this webinar, but if you want to get it, it's at um, um, httpinfo.aim.org. And then org, and then you got to remember this long URL: four steps to improve customer experiences. Just put dashes in between them. Four steps to improve customer experiences. Uh, and if you can't find it, just send me an email at johnmancini.org. But it'll be in the follow-up materials. But um, I put this together because I thought that it would be helpful to folks that wanted a really simple two-page piece of information that you could hand out to other folks in the organization to explain what we're talking about. 
and my Cracker Jack assistant uh, on this webinar, Teresa, points out that the link is in the resource list on the right side of the slides. So thank you very much for that, Teresa. I really appreciate it. So keep those questions coming. We'll get to them in just a couple of minutes here. So um, let me hand the baton back over um, to you, Jim, and kind of just um, walk through a couple things here re what relative to, uh, gosh, there's a long name here, EMC Documentum Captiva. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, John. Yeah, so uh, EMC, you know, obviously, you know, EMC Documentum is kind of the uh, uh, the suite of products, and Captiva is really focused on the capture portion. So here we have a lot of examples from customers in the field, and there's more. Uh, this is an infographic, which is kind of taking snippets of different use cases. You can see across the board uh, financial services, government, manufacturing, so well represented in all these industries. And, uh, you know, please reach out to me or, the, you know, information on the website to kind of get more detail on these uh, we call them uh, customer champion programs or success stories. So uh, appreciate that. And again, my name's uh, uh, Jim Hayes. I'm the principal uh, marketing manager for Capture at EMC. Uh, if you know Captiva for many years, you know we've been very successful at mailroom capture. And as mentioned, we're really following our own advice and advice from from AIM and all the analysts about really creating uh, extensions to our mailroom application that reach out closer not only to those remote offices but also to customers and also allowing our our customers and large organizations to embed a lot of those those valuable powerful uh, capture services directly within their own applications so those are a couple of ways that we've really been innovative over the last couple of years another is a product that we've recently introduced which is called snap uh, and that's based on our leap platform which is a SaaS based solution which is also very uh, intuitive in terms of the uh, user interfaces and provides users especially in remote capture uh, scenarios uh, a great interface to capture and process information and it also leverages back to that idea of leveraging the platform leverages a lot of those advanced recognition capabilities that we have within the mailroom environment so uh, even in our SaaS environment a lot of proven technology that's really based on um, customer-centric applications. So at that point, you know, I'll, uh, I'll pass it back to you, John, for questions. That would be terrific. So uh, again, uh, in the resources section, the resource list on the right-hand side, if you'd like to get the uh, tip sheet I mentioned earlier, you can uh, help yourself to that. We have some questions. Uh, Jim, is okay for a couple of definitional questions that people asked? I know the answers to these, <laughs> these questions, but I thought I'd give you a chance if you want to grab them. Um, uh, definition of advanced recognition. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So advanced recognition really is uh, two components are, are, are the key pieces. You have automated classification. So in the past, you know, you might think of barcodes at the supermarket. You know, you're scanning in uh, information based on barcodes. And a lot in the past that had been done uh, with uh, patch sheets and separator sheets. And now with automated classification, you can recognize without the use of any type of barcodes, patch codes, separator sheets, or manual interaction, those documents. And uh, the other key component is data extraction, which is known as uh, generally known through OCR or optical character recognition. And that's basically running either a zonal or a full text OCR to extract all the relevant data from a document and ideally, you're using a database to validate both those uh, uh, data streams, you know, the, the classified information and the extracted information to make sure you're getting the highest possible pass-through rate or, or um, accuracy rates. Does that make sense? Yeah, terrific. That's exactly on target. And then second definition somebody asked about is um, real-time capture. Yeah, and real-time is really an innovation that we came out with uh, in combination with mobile capture that enables customers to decouple a lot of the powerful capture services from the mailroom environment and put those directly within their own application. So real-time and mobile are really based on um, REST services technology that allow people uh, and organizations to really be effective in implementing these technologies. It can also be a standalone application. We have a, a, a great example with one of the top companies, uh, auto manufacturers in Germany, that are just importing uh, archives of PDF documents 
and immediately feeding their content management system with searchable PDFs. So another great use case is just using it as a standalone app. Cool. Another question. This is kind of a meat and potatoes question with regards to um, um, scanning and mobile capture. Is that um, any thoughts that you might have on whether and how images that are captured on mobile capture comply with digital image standards, and um, and is there a um, is there a way to destroy the original once you kind of um, you know scan with a mobile device? Say. Yeah, that's one reason folks are getting rid of. Uh, you know, fax and remote scanning is because you always have a paper document or, or a trail back to how do you get rid of that. So similar challenges with mobile, you know, you obviously have to delete it or figure out ways to, uh, you know, with governance to get rid of that image over time based on your business rules. Uh, to your first question, yeah, the, you know, image quality and the ability to use mobile captured images is definitely just similar to 10, you know, 15 years ago, is a scanned image going to hold up under scrutiny, you know, and that has been uh, accomplished over time. We anticipate, especially with the wide range of use of mobile capture, especially in banks, financial services, that a similar use and acceptance rate is going to be um, accomplished, if, if, in, if not already accomplished. Um, this was a question that um, popped up uh, on the slide that I had at the very beginning about digital disruption and uh, the list of uh, industries affected by it and um, mentioning that legal wasn't on the list. So um, um, the question, I, I don't think legal was in the initial survey, but maybe you could talk a little bit about, about how all of this affects, um, affects discovery and compliance and kind of like the risk side of the equation that we've all traditionally been involved in and you know, if you if you have a perspective on maybe how this might have, how disruption might play out in the legal business. Yeah, that's a great question because there's, there are a lot of paper intensive businesses that aren't under as much disruptive force, right? So, in the legal market, you might see uh, you know very large capture uh, environments, a lot of scanning, trying to capture all the attributes and information from the document. But it also could be uh, in addition to a lot of contracts being uh, captured. So you're really trying to capture a lot of metadata around the, con uh, the contracts themselves and then go back and find keywords. So I definitely think there's disruption in those types of industries, but probably not as acute as in, you know, more customer-facing applications. Um, a question here is, uh, do you recommend um, um, shredding once you scan? And again, uh, that goes back to the business rules, you know. Yes, go ahead, John, sorry. No, no, I was, I was going to probably respond the same way. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so really up to the business rules of, you know, how, do, how long do you need that paper copy? Um, and similar to a mobile captured image, you know, how long do you want to keep the, uh, the image itself or just, just you want to keep the data that the image produced? So really up in, the, in that case to business rules and um, kind of the logic behind it. So as we as we kind of get to the to the end of the hour, I wanted to invite everyone to check out some of our more in-depth training at aim.org/training. There's also a uh, list in the resources list. Um, more specific, specifically, our capture training. Um, and I'd like to have a reminder to everybody that um, we've recorded this webinar. It's going to be available in the next day or two at uh, AIM's Resources Webinars page. And don't forget to download the resources from the box to the right of the slide area, the PDF, and then the new tip sheet that I put forward. Um, once the webinar is over, a, a brief survey is going to open on the desktop. And we really do value your feedback. Um, both Teresa and I look at it in quite some detail. And we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can also offer comments and suggest future topics to cover. So please take a look at that. Um, I really would like to thank uh, the underwriter of this, uh, EMC Captiva. Um, without support from our solution providers, we wouldn't be able to bring you the free educational programs like this webinar. And so as we wrap this up, um, um, Jim, I'd like to give you an opportunity to just give um, just a quick closing thought, um, quick takeaway. And since I'm springing that on you, I'll go first. 
is that um, I guess what I'd like to leave people with is that um, this is not a time for business as usual. That's the first point, that um, disruption is all around us. These are the most disruptive times in terms of business models that I've ever experienced in my career. But the second point of that is to look for knowledge and look for competencies and capabilities within your organization that you can leverage to help deal with that disruption. Don't assume that everything that you know is wrong. Um, figure out what applies and apply that to the challenges moving forward. So, Jim, as the uh, as the underwriter of this, give me kind of uh, your last takeaway and go from there. Yeah, thanks, John. And I noticed quite a few questions. So anyone who has questions, please re reach out to us as well. Uh, I think, you know, this has been great in terms of, of working with, with AIM and doing the analysis around this. I think, I think one of the key lessons is really uh, is understanding the disruption in your own market and your need to really move into this digital transformation. Uh, one of the key takeaways that I've learned in talking to customers and analysts is really basing a lot of the, uh, the incremental steps on proven platforms and proven technology and then leveraging highly innovative technology uh, add-ons or extensions to that proven platform. So that, that's a real uh, a strong uh, guidance from all the research that we've done. And I want to say thank you as well, John and Teresa, for setting this up. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jim. It was really a lot of fun. I'd like to thank everybody for participating on the webinar. And don't forget to check out the resources section in order to get the downloaded versions and watch for the recorded version um, up on the web and you can share it with your colleagues. So for AIM, this is John Mancini, and for Jim, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.